Principal components analysis is a complex topic, and when you run one in SPSS, you get a lot of output. Some of this output is used to assess whether or not the data is suitable for principal components analysis, whereas some of it presents the results of the actual analyses. I'll provide you with a quick overview of the key points to consider, but for further information, you should consult some of the references on the StatHand website or app. So the first table of output is a correlation matrix. And in the top portion, you can see the intercorrelations amongst participants' responses to the five items. So there's a number of substantial looking correlations here. So for example, the correlation between adventure and novelty is 0.709. A number of substantial correlations in the matrix suggests that the data, or more specifically the correlations between variables, can be summarized with one or more components. If all of the correlations in this matrix are close to zero, then you should be wary about running PCA, as you're likely to extract as many components as you have items. Underneath the correlation matrix is the determinant. This is an indicator of multicollinearity. It should be greater than 0 0.00001, which it is here. Now the second table contains the kaiser meyer olkin measure of sampling adequacy, and Bartlett's test of sericity. These are additional measures that we can use to check that the data is suitable for principal components analysis. It's recommended that the KMO be above a minimum of about 0.6 and Bartlett's test be significant. Now here the KMO is almost 0.6, so I think we'll call it good enough. For information about how to interpret these statistics, you can consult some of the references in StatHand. The third table is called anti-image matrices. The only thing that you need to check in this table are the measures of sampling adequacy that run down the diagonal of the second part of the table. These figures indicate the degree to which each item is correlated with all of the others in the correlation matrix. Ideally, all of these individual measures of sampling adequacy should be above about 0.5 or 0.6. Any items with measures of sampling adequacy below this should be considered as potential candidates for removal from the scale. Here, they're all above the 0.5 threshold, although some are only just above. Now the next table, if we scroll down, is a table which reports the initial and the extracted communalities. The initial communalities represent the total proportion of variance in each item, which is always going to be one. The extracted communalities indicate the proportion of variance in each item, which can be accounted for by the extracted components in combination. The higher these figures are, the better. Now the next table down is the total variance explained table. And it tells us how many components have been extracted using principal components analysis. Remember, the rule that we set for extracting components was the Kaiser criterion, which says that we should extract components with initial eigenvalues greater than one. For the logic of why we do this, refer to some of the references which are listed in StatHand. Here, there are two initial eigenvalues greater than one, and thus two components have been extracted. And the decision to extract two components is confirmed by the scree plot, where you can see that there are two eigenvalues which clearly stand out above the other three. So now we know that two components have been extracted. The next question to ask is, what do these two components actually look like? And to answer this question, we need to keep scrolling. For now, we'll scroll past the component matrix and the uh, reproduced correlations matrix, and we'll stop at the pattern matrix. When you run an oblique rotation, this is generally the table that you'll be looking at to interpret your components. It contains what we commonly refer to as loadings. Now I've organized this table to make it easy to interpret, and I've done that by sorting the loadings by size and by hiding very small loadings, so slow loadings which are under 0.3. Now we can see that three items load onto component one, and all of these items appear to be about pragmatic or practical issues. So I might label this component something like practical considerations. Now the remaining two items load onto the second component, these items appear to be about pleasure or enjoyment. So I might label this component something like pleasure considerations. 
We can scroll past the structure matrix now and we'll have a look at the component correlation matrix. This tells you the correlations between components. So here we've extracted two components, so there's only one correlation that we need to focus on, and that correlation is negative 0.178. Now as a rule of thumb, if the correlations between components are greater than about 0.3 on average, then an oblique rotation like direct oblomin is more appropriate. If all the correlations between components are small, then oblique and orthogonal rotations will produce very similar solutions. Now if you want to try an orthogonal rotation and compare the two, you just need to repeat the steps that I described in the previous video, except choose Verimax instead of direct oblomin in the rotation dialog. And then, when interpreting the results, look for the rotated component matrix rather than a pattern matrix. So finally then, we should get a sense of whether our two component model is a good model. And there are a number of things that we can do that we can look at to do this, including, for example, looking at the proportion of variance accounted for by the extracted components in combination. And in our case, that's 72.65%. We can also look at the extracted communalities, and we can look at the interpretability of the pattern matrix. We can also, though, look at the reproduced correlation matrix to get a sense of goodness of fit. So essentially we've used a correlation matrix, which was the first table of output right at the top of this page, to develop a two-component model. Now if this two-component model is a good model, we should be able to use it to reproduce the original correlation matrix. And this is what we've done in the first part of the table that we're looking at on the screen. These are SPSS's best estimates of the correlations between items based on the two-component model. In the second part of the reproduced correlations table, we have what are called residuals. The residuals are the raw differences between the original correlations and the reproduced correlations. And the smaller the residuals, the better the model. Now, as a rule of thumb, we want the majority of these residuals to be trivial. Generally speaking, a fewer than 60% of them have absolute values greater than 0.05. We can argue that the model has done a reasonable job of reproducing our original correlation matrix. And here, it looks like we've just met that threshold. Now, when you write up a principal components analysis, there's quite a lot of information that needs to be reported. So in this case, what you would need to do is firstly explain how the five items were subjected to principal components analysis and that you used oblique rotation. And then we'd explain how we tested univariate normality and bivariate linearity. And there's advice on how to do this in StatHand. And we'd also want to report what we found here. We'd report on the checks that we looked at earlier in this video. So the bivariate correlation matrix indicated a number of substantial correlations. The individual measures of sampling adequacy were all above 0.5, as was the overall kaiser mayer olkin measure of sampling adequacy. We'd also report that Bartlett's test was statistically significant and that the determinant was 0.238. And we'd need to explain how two components were extracted and could, in combination, account for 72.65% of the variance in the data. And we'd then report the pattern matrix in a nicely formatted table and make sure that we named each of the components in that table. And we'd also provide some evaluation of goodness of fit. So making reference to any unusually low communalities, uh, making reference to the percentage of redundant residuals, and so on. So as I've said previously, there's a lot that you need to take into consideration when running principal components analysis. Take your time and use the resources that you have available to you, including those that we have listed on StatHand.